Let me start with a voice. Uh, it's not mine, it's neither human. And yet this voice carries a message. This voice is described by Frank Chapman, a pioneer writer of file guides, as a maniacal laugh. This is the voice of the, of the laughing falcon, a bird widely spread in the Americas. Chapman described this voice as resembling a call of a man in great pain, unpleasant and gruesome beyond description. Its English and scientific name refers to this call, which is also described in a more recent book as a sound of inscrutable mystery. In Colombia, and most particularly in Chocó, the region where I work, the name of this bird makes reference to this sound. Did you catch its name? <laughs> Waco. In countries such as Nicaragua, Guatemala, Salvador, or Mexico, the Waco is associated to seasonal change and the coming of rains. But in Colombia, Ecuador, or Brazil, its song announces death. Some historical sources describe how indigenous peoples associated this bird with bad omens. In 1808, after a visit to Chocó, the Spanish governor wrote that the lives of Indians that had not been converted to Christianity revolved around superstition and witchcraft. And also he described how they believed that every animal sound was an omen of events to come. In 2014, the Waco sang, and the Mbera people, the indigenous people living in this region, decided they have to leave their lands. According to these communities, the bird was preventing them from coming threats. Sometimes they refer to the Waco as the bird of war. And they heard, heard this song in 1994, when the guerrillas killed several traditional healers. These healers, or Haibanas, were accused of practicing witchcraft against guerrilla soldiers. After these Haibanas were killed, guerrilla soldiers had to make sure that they were really dead by plunging stakes of a palm into their victims. This form of killing was a measure taken to prevent these Haibanas turned into a Mohano, a monstrous man-eating jaguar. So when the Guaco sank again in 2014, Embera people knew it wasn't announcing good news. The event with the Guaco and the crimes against these traditional healers show to what extent armed conflict is embedded within a particular logic in which forest, people, animal and practices are intricately linked. Let me provide another example. Let me introduce a friend of mine, she's, she's Ramona. And she loves smoking unfiltered cigarettes. And she used to do so by keeping the lead end in her mouth. And once, during a conversation, Ramona told me about the fieras, uh, a word I traduce as wild beast. So she told me about the wild beast of the river, the Atrato River. So those beings are like aquatic, huge, and often voracious beings capable of causing a lot of havoc. So Ramona told me about a giant turtle that dug a hole in a ravine on the edge of the river, taking away a considerable amount of soil and leaving the town completely exposed to floods. This is her town. And this is the, Tr the Trato River, the, uh, a river that was granted particular rights in Colombia. So Ramona also depicted <laughs> fishes that become so huge that they could sink canoes, and groupers that had eaten people. A fiera 
is a special kind of being that lives in rivers. Sometimes a fiera is an ordinary fish that has grown excessively in size. Fieras like these usually inhabit swirls, rapids, and sharp bends of rivers. These beings and some features of rivers are not always distinguishable. For instance, this particular fiera, called the sierpe, is simultaneously a huge snake living underwater, but also the flood it provokes. A pronounced deep meander might be the preferred place of a fiera, but also might be an extension of its own body. So perhaps another way of conceptualizing what fieras are is by tying their form and their instantiated attributes. I mean, by considering their existence or substance and their spatial manifestations as one single thing. Form and trajectory are the same thing. In this way, swirls, rapids, or flutes are not just the manifestations of the presence of these fieras, but also they participate in the generation of their being. So Ramona told me this story about a grouper that used to be seen near her village. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to read uh, that story. So she's uh, telling me this story about a uh, war in this region. And when she mentions Pavarando, she's making reference to uh, forced displacement. So communities, Afro-Colombian communities from the regions for, were forced displaced from their lands. I have to be like in this condition during, during many years. So she's telling this story about this forced displacement that affected more than six uh, inhabitants of this region when in 1997 paramilitary and military operations obliged communities to abandon their lands. So at that time, air strikes become, became part of people's lives. And these attacks caused so much damage that if one listens to what Ramona says, they affected the landscape as well as the different beings that inhabit the rivers and forests of this region. So, the grouper's disappearance mentioned by Ramona is representative of a series of impacts that war has had not only on people's lives, but also on the lives of other living beings inhabiting these territories. So one of the things I have learned is that the understanding of armed conflict cannot be dissociated from the understanding of the relations people have with the places they, they inhabit. I also learned that what happened to fieras or wacos is a damage that extends beyond what we consider the environment and even what we consider violations of human rights. So to these communities, the experience of, war or of armed conflict is not confined to damage caused to people, but the consequences also concern the land and different non-human beings. In other words, and violence is an experience shared by multiple kinds of humans and other than human beings. And these violent transformations are addressed by indigenous and Afro-Colombian organizations in terms of damage inflicted to their traditional territories. The concept of territory has to do with a set of emplaced practices and relationships through which communities appropriate spaces and resources but also through which people share life with other kinds of beings. It's the threat face, faced by these large communities of life, what was invoked by indigenous organizations when they succeeded in 2003 in including the territory as a victim of war. So to these peoples, the actions perpetrated by armed groups have threatened the relations of care and reciprocity people cultivate with their forests, rivers, and other beings. So the way I interpret this law is that uh, it has opened the possibility of, for considering other kinds of violent consequences of armed conflict. My, po my point is that what, 
what is at stake in this law is not only the recognition of multicultural rights. I mean by considering the territory as a victim of war, people are addressing not only concerns about human rights and the respect for the world views, but concerns about the well-being of other than human beings. And this, as we have learned, this challenges politics because the recognition of the territory as a victim might bring into the public sphere a set of beings that have been traditionally assigned to symbolic or metaphysical spheres. So I wonder if the consideration of the territory as a victim can tell us something about the very nature of the damage caused by war, the impact in the world and the possibilities of reparation in a post-conflict scenario. Let me provide one last example. This is what the municipal secretary of Turbo, a town where I work, said in 2013 during an interview regarding the death of three fishermen that were killed by a jaguar. So given the fact that local villagers wanted to hunt that jaguar, the secretary explains that he is in solidarity with his human fellows, but that jaguars are endangered species protected by law. So as a result, the local environmental authorities and the Colombian army set in motion a plan to capture the jaguar and take it to the heart of a protected area. Almost a year later, after the death of two more peasants and the reaction of some local communities, the regional environmental authority issued a decree recalling that it was forbidden the hunting of jaguars. So the spokesperson of this uh, environmental authority institution made clear that what happened was the natural response of a jaguar to the threat human activities represent to its natural environment. The problem was that people observed the jaguar stalking prey in the forest several times and they discovered that the jaguar was not alone. Another jaguar and a cop were with this man-eating jaguar. So local people were very, uh, the, the, the fear increased for local people. So there was now an entire family of man-eating jaguars wandering in the forest. So it also happened that one of these jaguars attacked three marines who were patrolling the area during one of their counter guerrilla activities in the region. So in order to avoid another lethal attack, officials of the army decided to hunt down the jaguar themselves. So the military set a trap using a ship as a bait and to be sure their tactic would work, a soldier hid in a nearby tree. <coughs> but the trap didn't work and the marine almost became the prey. So the controversy of the whole story uh, revolved around where, whether or not the jaguar should have been hunted. To the environmental authorities, the jaguar had to be protected no matter what. Jaguars don't attack, they defend themselves because according to this narrative, uh, humans are somehow outside and above the food chain. To these authorities, to try to hunt the jaguar was proof of local ignorance. Peasants didn't know that jaguars are endangered species and that they only attack when people stray into their territories. For local people, these two ideas, namely that jaguars might one day become extinct and that they seldom go after humans, were hard to grasp. Jaguars in this region are experienced as wild, dangerous, and unreliable beasts. Their mere existence is a threat to humans because they feed on poultry, cattle, and even people if they have the chance. So in these regions, jaguars have occasionally attacked people, but never before had five different peasants been killed in such a short lapse of time. According to many people, if those jaguars dared to attack humans, it was either because they had lost their fear or they were experiencing an eagerness for something different. So the ferocious, ferocious jaguar and now his family were showing some kind of 
perverse preference which extended beyond what local environmental authorities described as the natural reactions of jaguars. There was something that got me thinking. The general secretary of the, this town said that the jaguar had killed some civilians. But why did he use the term civilians? Was it a slip of the tongue? Do jaguars differentiate between armed forces and civilians? Was the jaguar viola violating the rules of war, namely international humanitarian law and the protection of people who are not participating in hostilities? What if the slip of the tongue did say something about the nature of that particular jaguar? This is a picture uh, taken by a photojournalist, a well-known photojournalist, Colombian photojournalist called uh, Jesus Abad Colorado. And he took this photo in 2004 during the training of some paramilitary troops. As you can see, the men and their military equipment are all perfectly aligned. And yet, the uniformity of their formation is interrupted by the carefree walking of this jaguar. The weapons, military gear and posture contrast with the presence of a white animal that has been adopted as a pet. But the jaguar doesn't behave like a pet. He's walking and sniffing at his ease. He doesn't behave like pets such as the disciplined military dogs one can see in parades. Of course, the paramilitaries are not an ordinary army, just as jaguars are not common pets. Keeping a jaguar Keeping a jaguar as a pet might say something about the kind of masculinity these soldiers want to project. Considering the conditions necessary to capture a white predator. So the presence of the jaguar is symbolically powerful since the animal becomes a type representing particular values to which the paramilitaries identify themselves. The jaguar is the quintessential dangerous predator the ferocious hunter embodying attributes that soldiers and armies require. Stateliness, bravery, strength. But what if these traits are not just used to symbolize desirable values, but are also mobilized as a weapon of war? If we take another look at the picture, we find that there, among soldiers, rifles and military backpacks, the Jaguar also seems like another war device. But what kind of device? Later, I learned that the jaguar killing people belonged to a paramilitary chief who had kept the animal on one of his ranches and tried to raise, raise the jaguar as a pet. So the jaguar was released into the forest before the ranch of this chief was confiscated by the authorities. That confiscation was part of the agreement accepted by paramilitaries during their demobilization process. Uh, and with uh, Zay's goods and its intent, oh, perdón, sorry. <laughs> so the, the Jaguar was released after the demobilization process. And he gave uh, their properties uh, and their goods uh, with the intention to contribute to a victim's reparation fund. So, what I learned was that the paramilitary chief entertained himself by setting the jaguar loose on people to attack them, so that the animal learned to not be afraid of humans. The jaguar, some other people said, was used to get rid of the bodies of the people paramilitaries kidnapped and tortured. Apparently, the jaguar was kept in a cage and didn't kill people, but was fed with pieces of human bodies. So this is how the jaguar became accustomed to human flesh, a diet which he could, couldn't give up once he was set free in 2014, some time before the death of the first fisherman. So a jaguar accustomed to eating human flesh as the result of a paramilitary commander's training is, after all, a jaguar involved in the armed conflict. So it seems that the municipal secretary was indeed correct the jaguar was killing civilians. And this is evidence of how forests and animals have also been affected by war. So in my attempt to make sense of these events, a question about the jaguar still haunts me. Was this a jaguar and a half? 
I mean something more than an ordinary Jaguar? Or was it the half of a Jaguar? I mean, a being that lost part of its true animality. A Jaguar attracted to the taste of human flesh after being used by paramilitary armies as a device of war is no longer what people recognize as an ordinary Jaguar. A Jaguar belonging to a war lord is more dreadfully rapacious than one living in the forest. A Jaguar turned into a weapon is greeter than the Jaguars people are used to encountering in the forest. Yet, these key features let me consider that the Jaguar was actually something less than an ordinary animal. Let me explain with the following images. In his analysis of the illustrations published in 1841 by French artist Jean Granville, Jean Berger argues that unlike some traditions in which the purpose of portraying a person as an animal was to reveal a particular aspect of their character, for example, a lion to represent courage or a donkey to exemplify stubbornness, in these illustrations, animals are not moral metaphors. Instead, they are being used in mass to people's situations, and they have become prisoners of social situations that are not of their own. Similarly, the man-eating jaguar causing so much havoc was coerced into solving the sinister business of people involved in a dirty world. It's this involvement in two human worlds what makes me think that the jaguar is actually the half of a jaguar. Imprisoned in the situations of men and perverted by human affairs, his jaguarness faded away. But the most I think about it, about it, I think that the jaguar is neither more nor less than a jaguar. I feel that by framing the question in such terms, I'm taking away its own agency. After all, it is true, its own acts, hunting in manners that are both efficient and impeccable, racing and feeding cops, successfully evading hunters, it's through those uh, actions that the jaguar participates in the transformative relations which people in this region have experienced. Perhaps the jaguar is simultaneously both, a being exceeding the drives of his own condition and a being halfway from his own jaguarness. And perhaps it is by affirming this hybridity and this multiplicity that we can better understand how war and violence becomes an experience shared by human and other than human beings. So in my research, I have learned that experiences of pain and suffering are not always confined to people. That among indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities, violence perpetrated against a person cannot always be distinguished from the suffering inflicted on the large communities of beings that constitute their, their world. How can we assess the impacts of war when its consequences are so far-reaching? If the impact of war goes beyond humans, then human rights, the current framework through which the ongoing effects of this violence is redressed, might be of limited value. What kind of justice do we need if what is at stake is not only human well-being, but also the well-being of a much wider assemblage of beings? And these questions matter because their answers might allow us to create conditions for policies of truth, justice, and reparation, as well as to move beyond the traditional definition of human rights towards an ethical relationality vis-a-vis -vis the beings that make us human and the worlds to which we humans give life. Thank you very much. <laughs>